In about 2000, as Glenn alluded to earlier, the Twickenham Missions Committee began evaluating a change in the thought of how they were doing missions. Instead of supporting a number of them to be focused and increase significantly the amount of support that we gave to missions. Um, through God's leading, in 2001, a subset of those men went down to Ecuador uh, through a number of directions and pointing that God gave to them and uh, found need for a children's home in Tabacundo, Ecuador. And then became, began the search that we've talked about for a director. Uh, and through God's help, Jerry and Patricia Schneider accepted that position and that assignment uh, essentially 10 years ago, so happy anniversary. <laughs> and 2002, very early January, I think it was, about, he came, they came and stayed with us for about three months uh, to get to know the congregation. I've told him that you'd have to do that every couple of years because we're a very mobile society and 10% changes almost every year. But uh, uh, he spent some time with us and we grew to love him. He went and spent six months in Guatemala to be immersed in a Spanish culture and learn Spanish. Uh, he will maybe confess <laughs> that it didn't work as well as we would like. <laughs> and he would like to speak Spanish better, but uh, uh, he does a great job and, and still has managed just to communicate. Uh, he wishes he could do it better. In 2003, they finally got on the ground in Ecuador and began the work. And by late that year, we had our first children, even before we had our first home built. But by May 2004, we had the first CASA completed. Now, to hurry it up, since that time, we've completed a lot of other things. We have the apartment built. We've got two more CASAs completed. Um, God sort of changed our direction a little bit. and We, we knew we needed schools for the children. Uh, it wasn't working as very well down there. And he led us to, to start a school uh, with the help of Justin and Amanda coming down. And, of course, we've had a number of iterations of construction on the school, the first one being that somehow he figured out how to take a, an old dairy barn structure and turn it into a school area. Uh, and it was really neat. And then expand from there as we, as we had the funds and the needs. Uh, along with a lot of other smaller infrastructure developments, anything from a, kitchen, a, a chicken coop uh, to having power generation, generator down there so that we can finally not have losses in power for the school and the homes that was badly needed. And then some of us can remember, I didn't uh, say that at the earlier service, that uh, we got the best-looking aqueduct in the neighborhood. And a bunch of us remember that years ago, when concrete and bricks in an aqu aqueduct. Um, and we increased the original property we, we purchased down there next to the to camp was 14 acres, and we expanded that to 35 acres as we started seeing the need for growth in the future. We now have 16 children in our care, there's over 125 local children attending our school, and many of those have a lot of financial aid, and some of them couldn't go if we weren't there. And based on uh, all those things going on, supporting in the community, a local congregation now is down there with well over 100 people attending. God has blessed this mission in Ecuador, and he's led us and helped us evolve over the years. And throughout all those years, Jerry and Patricia have been our folks on the ground leading the way to these accomplishments in God's work. There's been a lot of challenges. It's a third world country. If you've been down there with any of the groups, you only get a glimpse. But from sickness and some serious health problems uh, to continual changes in the law to some basic issues with the culture of the people in Ecuador that we're there to change, and then healing some, some deep scars in the, in the children that we have brought in to care for. We've had challenges, and we only see a glimpse, and Jerry and Pat have lived with those every day working through it, and we really appreciate that. They've kept the faith and their commitment to God and the mission to Ecuador. You know, we, we help from here, and we do a lot of things, but, you know, we are so tempted as a nation, as a community, to get um, tied up in the American dream and trying to take care of ourselves and put, you know, and, and uh, not always listen to God and his calling. And I'm humbled by their courage to step out and step away in responding to God's calling. So 
with all that, let me introduce Jerry Snyder. He's a genuine man of God and has a great passion for our God's work in Ecuador. And we love him. Thank you very much. Well, I want to, uh, to tell everybody here that um, this is not Tennessee orange, it's Oklahoma State University orange. <laughs> and I'm proud of that. I've been working a long time trying to get ready to come down here because I disrespect uh, Lincoln and, and Art Leslie and guys like that and Tim Logan. So I, I've grown my hair a little longer to where I can just be just like those guys. So I, I, just, wow. I just really appreciate it. Wow. <laughs> Have you ever been asked to do a really important new job that just takes a lot of responsibility? In this crowd, I know there's been a lot of you who've been asked to do things like that. Our lesson today is going to talk about that. It's going to be about a man that uh, Moses tapped on the shoulder and said, you need to follow me. You need to take my place. You need to lead God's people. Joshua was a man who had that kind of uh, uh, question asked to him. And as he uh, thought about that, I can just see him uh, walking around for days and praying and thinking, uh, yeah, I've been with Moses all this time. I've seen him in action. I've seen some of the mistakes he's made. I've seen all the ways that God has led him. Surely I can do that. But you know, he had to hear the words, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And God himself talked to Joshua and let him know that he was going to be with him and that he was going to guide him and it was going to be hard, but he was going to be there with him. In January, uh, Pat and I will have been uh, a part of this mission 10 years. It all started late one night when we received a call from Kent and Charlotte Markham in Ecuador waking us up and asking us to sit down and consider when they said, will you come to Ecuador and help us? To be honest, it scared us to death. Because at the time, we had all of our children around us, our families. Uh, we were involved in church. I was a shepherd there. We had a good career going. We had a farm. Everything that, that made us believe that life was good and that we were going to be set for a long time. But there, that nagging question was, will you come to Ecuador and help us? And it was in June when we got the call, and it was late or mid-December when we finally decided that this call wasn't from Kent and Charlotte Markham. It was from God. And to say no to God is a very serious thing in my life. And so it was even more scarier to, uh, to sell all of our things, sell our farm, give away the rest of it, and move away from Oklahoma for the first time in our lives and go someplace that we didn't know and be something that was only God's ability to change. We could only speak Spanish by saying tacos before, and we can't do much more than that today. Joshua needed to hear the words, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. And I'm sure that uh, Art Leslie needed to hear that same thing. Darren and Summer needed to hear that same kind of talk when they made recently some major decisions to change their lives in a major way. And there may be some of you this morning who are thinking about your ministry to God and what it entails and how you can make some decisions that are very serious I encourage you, take, take the lesson that I'm going to give you today to heart. I was reading, to get ready for this, I was reading uh, some of those little bee books by Warren Risby. Warren has read, 
has written some books about be courageous and be strong and some different things. And one of the things that I was reading, he said when he was in school, he didn't remember much about chapel time. But there was one lesson that he remembered the points of. And it was about Moses and about Hebrews and about faith. And when I read that, like Lincoln says, it really cranked my tractor. I really like this. And so this morning, I'm going to borrow that for my points. See the invisible, choose the imperishable, and do the impossible. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Joshua 1, 9. How do you see the invisible? Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is the, the way you find it. You read that chapter and you'll see that faith is the confidence that, we, that um, what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. That's what faith is. That's a real good definition of what faith is all about. And I want to encourage you to, to think this morning, to be able to see the invisible. See the invisible. This picture of a bunch of kids at chapel time is what will happen in the morning. About 100, Steve, 166 students will come together and it'll look something like this picture as they all get ready for chapel for a 30 minute time with God. Was that visible to any of us 10 years ago? Not our way. We, we see that now, but it was invisible to us before. Here's a young man named Christian who is the oldest of our children. He came to us as a kid who was actually sleeping on a little mat out in the jungle under trees and eating fruit because that's the only life he had. He was already running around with some gang kids and robbing houses at night at an early, early age. Christian came to my door the day before we were ready to come to the States, and he says, Pops, all the kids call me Pops and Pat, Granny, Grandma. He said, Pops, can I borrow your camera? I want to do something. And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. What are you going to do? He said, I just need to take some pictures. So I gave him my camera, and he left, and after a while he came back, and he said, there's a movie on here that if you go to Twickingham, I'd like for you to show that to them. I said, what is it? He said, oh, you'll see. Just, just look at it. I, I just wanted to do it. And so what you're seeing here is completely unrehearsed. I didn't have anything to do with it other than carrying it to you, and I want you to listen to him. Hi, everybody. I'm Christian. And, well, I just wanted you to know that how we are here, how we are feeling right here in the Hacienda. Uh, first of all, in the Hacienda, all the children are really glad and happy to be here and to enjoy this opportunity that God and Jesus has given us to have a nice place to live and with people that love us and care for us. Also for the school, we are so glad right now for the roof, the, the new roof that we got is so bright inside, it's helping us to see better, to study better, it's, it's great. And also for the Education that we are receiving here is is nice. Uh, we like we like the the question and we love it. Uh, we love studying. So thank you for that. Also, I wanted to say something for the some of the people that are working here, like Miss Kathy and Miss Lengi. They are doing a very very good job here, a great job here. So we wanted to thank that. Also, Mr. Justin and Miss Amanda, they are doing a great job here in the school. Um, also, Pops and, gra and Grandma, uh, they are doing 
great. Uh, they are great people and they are working hard here. So when we also want to thank for that. And just that we are going to say thank you for everything that the, you have given us, uh, the opportunity that you have given us, all the things that you are doing for this project here. We are going to say thank you very much and God bless you and God love you. Thank you. Christian didn't ever go to school before he came to us. He didn't have a chance to get ready to go to school. He had to learn how to read, how to write, how to do everything. He was so far behind and he's been like a sponge just working so hard to try to get his education. And Lord willing, uh, in, in this next year, he's gonna accomplish so much if he works hard and continues to work hard. He's got, uh, he's got to finish up this year because he's 18 now. And the, uh, the curriculum that we use uh, actually says that if a, a student doesn't graduate by the time they're 18, they can't help them any further. And so he's working extra hard at nights and weekends to get his studies done. And, and one of the goals he has, if, if he gets all of his work completed, he, he will be allowed to travel to Florida to take the final exam to get his high school education. And that's what he really wants to do is to make a short trip to the States and, 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 and graduate high school. That's accomplishment that he wants to make. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Twickenham, for making that possible for this young man. Thank you for working so hard in the Envision campaign. And we're just about, we're on the final leg of getting the last of this year taken care of financially. And what you've done, what you've allowed us to do is extraordinary. And I, I'm like Christian. I, I just want to say thank you for all that you, each one, have done in sacrificing for the Envision campaign. It's wonderful. Things like this. This is just one little part that, that we're able to do with the contributions of the Envision campaign. By faith, we know that the future of kids like Christian is very good. Proverbs 22.6 says, Direct your children into the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Just be able to see the invisible where these kids will go and the families that they will impact, their own families is incredible. Christian is so excited about his faith. We went on a road trip last year and he begged us to go by the jungle and find his aging grandfather and we did and a couple of hours later he had convinced this uh, 80 some year old uh, man living in the backwoods of the jungle that he wanted to be baptized for the remission of his sins. And so Christian took him down to the creek and we found the spot and Christian baptized him into Christ as we all stood and cried and looked on. That's the kind of future, if you can just see the invisible, that's, that is the, uh, the things that we have in front of us. And I wanna challenge you to choose the imperishable this morning how do you do that? What is imperishable? I think that what we need to do is figure out what is perishable and imperishable in this country. When Pat and I uh, come here, we have a problem anymore with reverse culture shock. This last week, we had to go to Houston, Texas to work on our visa application and meet with the consulate of Ecuador who has an office in Houston. And while we were there, Luck would have it, we had a family reunion on my mother's side of the family. Uh, it was called Dozens of Cousins and we all got together. They had rented this house that was on Galveston Island and it, y'all, it was four stories tall with an elevator in it. And this house uh, come down to the bottom of the, and the bottom floor went right out to the bay where there was a couple of boat slips with boats in them and we got to fish off there. Pat caught a big old flounder. We had so much fun with all of them. But I, I want to ask you, what is perishable and imperishable? A, re, a, treat, a retreat house on the water? 
These houses in this community were over a half a million dollars each. And it was just a place where people come and, and spend a little bit of time during the year to get away from the pressures of life. And maybe a boat to use at the retreat house. That would be nice. Some of these boats that were hanging up, suspended from the air, cost I don't know what they cost, but it was amazing to me. And then, of course, you, you know, you'd need to have an extra weekend retreat vehicle so you can go to the store when you go to your retreat house and ride your retreat boat. It, it just really gets me how we think about ourselves, about things that are, what's the word? Perishable. And so we need an education. We need to understand what is perishable and imperishable in our lives. These things are perishable, folks. They're going to be gone someday. Is learning of God and a Christian education imperishable? Yeah. You see, that's what we need to be thinking about. Things that are imperishable like an education for some kids like Christian that's going to go out and have a family that's going to grow and, and have other Christians that will be a part of it. I'm from a Christian background. That means that my mother and dad and my father's mother and dad come from uh, marriages where they celebrated 75 years of marriage together always going to church. A Christian heritage. Most everybody in Ecuador that I meet that's a Christian is our first generation Christians. They're just learning about Jesus. They're just learning how to become a Christian. What we have an opportunity to do is teach these children what a real home looks like, what a mama and a daddy look like in a home setting. And that's what we're doing, showing them a good home and a good Christian education. By the way, while I'm talking about that, I uh, just want to show you, we're one step closer to becoming an uh, ACE model school, which means that uh, there's only one other model school in all of South America. And in order to have a model school, you have to have a lot of things in place. And one of those things in place is to have a privilege room where kids who do extraordinary things, they make good grades like Christian's doing, and they help others who are struggling to, to get their homework done. They, they are opening doors, they're picking up trash outside, they're speaking at uh, church on Sunday or leading singing, or doing extraordinary good things they get the right to go to the privilege room at certain times when they get their work done. A privilege room is set up with a ping pong table. Ours has got a foosball. Uh, it's got a little library over in the corner of the internet. They can go in there and really uh, have fun because they're honored for what they're doing. And we're one step closer because we just opened our privilege room last week, and I'm, I'm happy to say that. Uh, this is one of our learning centers in our school. We have a, a big area that has six learning centers where kids can go in. It's in a situation where it's nice and quiet like a library. They can um, uh, sit and, at their desk and work at their own pace, all in English. So they learn English as well as learning math and science. And they're doing this at, with the help of people like Kathy Jones, who help them to understand the, what, they're, what they're studying. And they uh, test through that. It's a wonderful, wonderful career. Uh, I mean, wonderful uh, curriculum. <clears throat> and just recently, uh, we, we had to replace all the roof because it, it just all of a sudden started cracking and, and rain and, and hail even coming in to uh, the, the rooms. And we've got that all replaced. In fact, the day I left, we've finished up doing it. But now, nearly every room has a, a nice skylight. It's nice and bright. We have new office space. Uh, uh, we had to have 
uh, a certain amount of offices to meet the, uh, the government of Ecuador's regulation on schools, and we didn't have that before. Now uh, we have new offices that uh, we can put uh, our staff in. So those are ways that we're, we're trying to help see and do um, and understand the imperishable. Another way that uh, I want to show you that it's things that are imperishable is this picture of our staff. This is, uh, represents all of our house parents, and, and now we are, for the first time, all fully staffed that we have house parent and relief house parents, and these guys help us. Uh, God has a considerable investment in these lives of the faces you see here that are imperishable. Their work with our children is imperishable work. And we need to understand what imperishable and, and perishable is all about. This next picture is uh, some construction. It's a house. There was a lady that uh, is a part of our staff at school that has some children. She doesn't have a home. She's uh, renting a little deal that has uh, a dirt floor and she cooks inside. Um, we, we prayed about her and her needs, and Justin was here last, uh, last year. He talked to some people around in different congregations, and uh, different ones gave a little bit to raise all together. I think we got $5,000, and we're building this lady, Miss Clemencia, a, a new home that will have cement floors and, and windows and doors because we want to show her God's love is imperishable. She's a going to, uh, now she's attending along with some other ladies, a uh, Thursday night ladies Bible class with Amanda, and she's learning, she's hungry for the things that, uh, that the Bible has to teach her about God's love. And now I want to, to close with the idea that we need to do the impossible. Joshua was told, be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore by, my, by their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. That was uh, words that God spoke to Joshua. You look at Joshua's life. Joshua's job looked impossible. Just think with me for a little bit about when he was given this job and he's got all these thousands of people and he walks out to the River Jordan and it's at flood stage and he looks across that all that water going across there and knowing he has to get all these people safely on the other side, probably throws a rock and skips it and thinks, how is this going to happen? He's like me, he probably said, I have no idea, but God's going to do it somehow or another. Think about those walls at Jericho, how thick they were, and how tall they were, and how he, he came over and probably scratched his head. How are we going to get past these walls to take this city? And God showed him away. Remember the sin that Achan had committed and caused all the problems with Israel and God had to figure out who this person was. God knew it was, but Joshua had to figure out. It's like a needle in a haystack. You take all these thousands of people and try to figure out which one has committed the sin. How would you do that? That job would be impossible. But God took care of it. All those thousands and thousands of people that Joshua had to be in charge of, of annihilating because it was his job. Every morning his wife come in, Joshua, it's time to get up, go to battle. You got to go have the war today and kill some more people. His job was impossible. Impossible job. There's a story here that I won't take the time to read it to you, but it's about when Joshua was in a battle. It was so important. It was so big. 
that it took all day long and they still wasn't done. So God caused the sun to stand still and they fought another whole day. Can you imagine how tired those soldiers were? I got to kill one more. <laughs> it's just incredible. The job that Joshua did was impossible. And yet, he was able to do it. You take a look at uh, first, or 2 Corinthians 12, 10. And Paul says, I don't know how God has done all these things through me in my life. I just don't know. But that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and hardships, persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. This next video, I, I, I muted it. It's, it's one that Christian, I found it on the camera. It was one that wasn't quite as good as the other one. But I want you to think about something. Think about the odds of a church like Twickenham. Glenn was right. Twickenham has had a, a kind of a rocky past in the past. It was just incredible that it's here today. If you don't believe me, ask some old codger like Jim Van about all the things that's gone on. <laughs> he can tell you, tell you a lot of stories. It's amazing that this congregation is what it is today. But then think about these crazy guys that decide, let's go to Ecuador. Let's go down there and build an orphanage. They've never had an orphanage down there. Our brotherhood has never, ever built an orphanage in Ecuador. Let's go down there and do that. Okay, we're going to get somebody to do it. Let's go to Oklahoma and get some of them dumb Okies that's a farmer to go down there and do it. And he, even though he doesn't speak Spanish, he'll be okay. <laughs> Think about it. That's impossible, isn't it? It is impossible. And yet God has accomplished that. You can come down there and look around and see what God has accomplished through all my bumblings and pat and, and our bumblings around and trying to get stuff done. And, and it just makes you scratch your head. Justin said when he came down, he was amazed because he is a Spanish teacher, him and Amanda both. They taught uh, in Arkansas for five years, taught Spanish. And when he came down, he saw us and he said, I, I don't understand when dad goes out and talks to all of his workers every morning, I don't understand a thing he's saying in Spanish, and they all understand and go to work. <laughs> We've got our own lingo, I guess. How did that happen? It happens because God has been with us, because we put our faith in Him, and He's accomplishing these things. We're all a part of it, and it's just impossible, and yet it's going on. I want to thank you. This last video is just some of our people saying thank you. And I echo what they have said. Look at this. Thank you. That's all I have to give, is just to thank you. It's so little compared to what you've done. There may be some of you this morning that's here, and you're thinking, I need to be doing some different things. Maybe God has been tugging on your heart a little bit to do this or that in a ministry that you know you can do. But you're having a little trouble with the decision 
Our shepherds here are wonderful men. They're extraordinary men of God. They would love to hear from you if you want to grab one of them after service and sit down and just get this off your heart. You're welcome to do that. They would love to hear from you and they'll pray with you. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you that you allow us to have time together every first day of the week to remember your son and remember his, uh, his life, his death, to be able to sing together and have uh, such encouragement and to study some, some more of your word and learn more. Help us, Father, to see the invisible, to understand what is imperishable, And Father, to do the impossible. Thank you for all your help in the past. As we go forward, we ask you to please be with us and help us every step of the way that your kingdom might be advanced in Ecuador and South America. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray.